So Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, piece, piecing together a bit of your background, I uh, see that you started your own precious metals company, and that seemed to be right around when you came out of university. So I'm curious how like such a young dude decides to go into precious metals, which to me seems like an old man's game, lots of gray hair. Yeah. Uh, and, and then we'll move on from there and talk about gold into Bitcoin. Mm, great. Yeah, so I was investing in precious metals uh, well before um, my, my business. And I had a, a part of it was my interest in uh, money and what uh, money is derived from. And the, uh, when we look at what money is, uh, we see that there are certain times where things like precious metals were uh, a form of money. So it was a great way to preserve your wealth uh, as almost like a savings account. And uh, there was a 20-year bear market for precious metals between 1980 to the year 2000, and that was primarily uh, uh, a what drove the market into uh, this old man's game because <laughs> uh, a lot of people had lost interest in, in precious metals. And so what I was very interested in was uh, helping people understand financial responsibility and uh, something that we don't really get in our education or get in school. And uh, I think a lot of the incentives that are in place today drive people to not be incentivized um, or, or have make good decision making when it comes to their finances. And so uh, I didn't start the company. I actually bought it from a friend uh, okay. in the university and uh, he wanted to go into banking. I saw a lot of potential in the industry. And so uh, I, was, I was really fortunate in that uh, gold and silver were starting to appreciate substantially in the early 2000s. So I actually liquidated some of my precious metals holdings to buy the company. And uh, what was very small grew into uh, quite a large uh, business. And part of the reason why was because we managed to use the internet to promote and uh, sell our products, where a lot of people in the precious metals industry, as you pointed out, are uh, over the age of 50, they don't even know how to use things like email. And so there was a, a great opportunity for uh, us to launch a website and sell to um, new investors who are interested in exploring the ideas of personal responsibility and uh, financial well-being. It was right after the uh, financial uh, meltdown in 2008. Yep. And so there were a, a lot more people interested in looking into what the heck is happening in the market, what's, what's happening in the economy, to, uh, and a lot of them were younger people. And so, um, so it's, this started to spur uh, a, lot, a lot of interest from uh, young, younger people um, people into buying and investing in precious metals. And so what exactly are we talking about here? Gold, silver, anything else? Yep, uh, gold, silver, uh, the primary ones, but palladium, platinum, um, there, yeah, so a couple other metals, but, but those were the big ones. And primarily as like an investment vehicle for people to use? Correct. And I don't really like to think of it as an investment. Okay. When I look at investments, I, I see it as something that will give me a yield or will appreciate in value, where I look at gold and silver more as a savings account or insurance. And uh, because they don't really change in value. If you look at the what you can buy with gold 100 years ago, it's the same that you could buy today. If you look at the average income that people make in gold uh, 100 years ago people were earning about a tenth of an ounce of gold a day today the average income is about a tenth of an ounce of gold a day and so okay so can i just get stuck on this a bit 100 yeah. years ago we were earning about the same in gold terms is that because the price of gold in dollar terms has gone up how does that yeah so uh the uh, and you can even look 300 years ago so uh what you can your purchasing power with gold over the last 300 years hasn't changed 
So you can buy a car, a horse. Um, you couldn't <laughs> buy a car because they didn't exist. Right. But uh, with the same amount of gold today as you could 300 years ago. And that is one of the uh, key elements that make gold a, a great form of money is that it's stable. And so uh, when we look at the value of gold, the value of gold hasn't changed. Uh, what we have seen is the price of gold relative to dollars change. And that's generally because the uh, money printing that's been involved with, with the dollar. So right before you got into precious metals, uh, there was a very long bear market, you said about 20 years. And was that affected by the relative value staying flat or going down? It was uh, in, in, uh, affected by a few things, but uh, primarily in 1971, that was the year that we left uh, gold as the monetary system of the world. And at that time, 35 US dollars uh, bought one ounce of gold. And it was pegged that way for uh, many decades. And we, uh, th there were a lot of um, uh, countries in the world that pegged their national currencies to the US dollar, believing that the US dollar would always be pegged right. to gold. So rather than pegging their uh, national currencies to gold, they believed that the US dollar was as good as gold. And during the 50s and 60s, the U.S. government had a lot of expect expenditures. Uh, they were war in Korea, they were war in Vietnam, and they had to fund it. So um, they funded it by creating more paper dollars than uh, what could be backed by their gold reserves. And so uh, it was the, the French that uh, tried to redeem their dollars for physical gold because basically that was the the peg where uh, a country could redeem US dollars for an exact amount of gold. And so when the French went to do that in 1971, the US said, oh, we, we can't do that. And uh, I think that's really the date that they declared bankruptcy. Right. There's this famous website, WTF happened in 1971. Mm. Uh, and so, and the, so the French thing, I, I'm sure I've heard the story, but I can't quite place it. Was was that directly responsible, or were they already planning on like ditching uh, the gold standard, and then French came along? They're like, "Well, now's a good time to get on with it." Yeah, I, um, I don't know for certain, but my guess is the, F the French were trying to see whether they would actually be honored. Okay, calling um, the bluff. Yeah, and okay. uh, and but I think. Uh, things were already in the works. And so uh, what was $35 to an ounce of gold for, for decades uh, quickly went from 1971 to $800 an ounce of gold in uh, the late 1970s. And that uh, was driven through um, this excessive money printing. And uh, that was um, responded to by Paul Faulkner, who was the chairman of the Fed at the time, uh, increasing interest rates. And uh, interest rates went to double digits. And that was really what burst the, the bubble uh, and, and the, the gold price. And so uh, that, that's when we started to see the, the gold price dropping, primarily as a response to uh, the, 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 the managers of the, the dollar saying, well, maybe you guys are doing a little bit better as stewards of, of the U.S. dollar and uh, being a little bit more conservative about how you're managing it. And so uh, that strengthened the U.S. dollar uh, during that period of time. All right. So you see, do you still see gold as a savings tool? I think, uh, yeah. So I, I don't see gold as, as money anymore. Uh, I think that time is long past. Uh, I, th um, I think it's being de-pegged as a storage of value and transitioning itself more towards a, a industrial use. And uh, if you think about uh, gold's properties, uh, it's one of the best uh, conductors of electricity in the world. And so uh, most smartphones have gold 
in, in them in their CPUs. And uh, we're, we're, there's lots of different industrial uses. So, so uh, we're seeing that transition of gold away from a storage of value and more towards uh, other use cases. And so uh, this puts less demand on gold as, as a storage of value. Uh, but we already see something like 50% of gold is, is jewelry. And we, we love shiny objects. Right. And that's not going to change. Uh, but I think it's, it's dual purpose, especially in, in places like India, where it's, it's jewelry and that uh, form of savings. Slight sidebar here. Have you seen, I think it was the Turkish story, they announced they found like massive reserves of gold. Uh, it, it might not be Turkey, I'll have to check that. Um, but something like as much gold has ever been mined, they, they said, oh, we found a new, a new reserve. What, what do you think that does to the gold market? Wow, yeah, I, I haven't seen that, uh, and uh, uh, it's it's interesting as a commodity because unlike other commodities or things that we have, the gold supply is all the gold mined since the beginning of time, and so it's a, a very large supply, and part of the reason why gold doesn't really uh, corrode. And so um, when, when we add to the gold supply, it's a very small amount each year. And we have seen uh, rushes in Australia, uh, even New Zealand and California. And those were uh, increased the gold supply, but not by huge amounts. Um, and so even if there is, you know, they say something like 70% of the world's gold is in, in the oceans. And if technology can be found to extract that, then uh, I think that, uh, isn't necessarily a bad thing. It might make it more useful in industry yeah. long term. You mean like to actually dissolved in seawater? If yeah. we could yeah. process enough seawater, we could yeah. get out en enough gold. Um, so if gold is not viable for money anymore, which which I don't think it is, uh, you know, we've got that story about France not being able to redeem their gold. Um, it's very difficult to verify gold if you're just an average Joe and you go down, buy some, or you inherit some, you know, you're not too sure of the quality and the purity and the value uh, and, and all of that. And if you do have a lot of it, you know, it's physically heavy and dense to move around and, and carry around. Um, so let's, let's go with money. What then is money, if not gold? How would, how would we go from there to transition into defining money? Mm, great question. Uh, so my definition of money, and I think if you talk to different people, uh, they'll have different definitions. And this is one that, that I've uh, come up with, and that is a universal uh, medium of exchange. And uh, or uh, so, so I think if you look at something like the internet, there are, or even things like blockchain, there are a lot of def different definitions. Uh, and different meanings uh, because they are technologies. And so I, I do see money as a technology, as a, a protocol, uh, and as a language of value. And so my definition is of money is a, a universal uh, language of value. And so some of those properties, uh, when I say universal, that means uh, we, we can look at medium of exchange. It doesn't mean everyone accepts it, but uh, it's it's widely accepted uh, in most places, uh, and then the other properties are things like unit of account and storage of value. Where I think with what's happening in, in cryptocurrency and in the blockchain space, we are potentially segregating some of those definitions and uh, ha which have new implications between a storage of value versus medium of exchange. People have yeah, really gone at this stuff hard by people. I guess I mean the Bitcoiners uh, have really attacked all of these aspects and, and tried to figure it out. Uh, I like the reference to it as a technology. I would tend to agree with that. Do you think as a technology it would be inevitable if we ran the simulation again? We would come up with money and maybe follow up. Do we ever evolve past having a method of exchange and a unit of account? Hmm. Great questions. If we, if we simulated again and we wanted the civilization that we have today, then money would be a necessity. Uh, what it enables is the division of labor. 
and uh, and so that that division of labor allows us to specialize and uh, create and, and build things that we can then trade. And the, the main reason why we couldn't barter is, is something called coincidence of wants. And so if I have, if I'm a shoemaker and you are uh, producing chi- uh, eggs or chickens, then you might need one pair of shoes. And so I can do that one trade, but I might need eggs on a consistent basis. Right. And so uh, you, you might want to sell eggs. Uh, I might want to buy eggs, but I don't have something that you uh, want to buy. And so money is a tool that enables me to sell shoes to anyone who needs them and then uh, acquire goods and services that, um, that I can use. And so uh, it's, it's really a, an important piece of um, our, our foundation of, of civilization. And uh, I don't think that we can or will move past it. I think uh, it's, I I, I mean, who who knows what happens in the future, but uh, I see money as something like a language, like the the English language. Uh, You know, can we move past something like uh, the English language? Um, (laughs) Sure, we can change the forms and and ways that we communicate, and uh, that's going to evolve, and that's where, where we see money is going to evolve to meet our needs and wants. But uh, it, it will be something important for us to uh, be able to find our ends and, and follow them. Yeah, I like uh, looking towards science fiction to try to see some creativity. And a common theme in science fiction is that people in the future always use credits. Mm. There's some sort of credits. Uh, occasionally, you get a Star Trek episode where they encounter, you know, the utopian world, and they've. They've done away with all forms of value transfer like this, mm. uh, and and it never ends well. Yeah, a post scarcity world. Uh, we're we're certainly heading in that direction where the, the marginal costs of, of goods and services are um, dropping substantially. Uh, however, there's uh, always scarcity in the in the universe, and money helps um, create signals where. Uh, it enables uh, information. If we look at things like prices, um, this is where money is, is a good unit of account because uh, prices have a lot of information embedded in them. And that enables us to make decisions as individuals and allocate our resources uh, how we see fit. And so um, w- when we look at uh, and this is where it's important to have that stable form of money, uh, because when you start tampering with it, then it uh, pr- prevents us from making informed decisions. And so uh, it creates distortions in the market, distortions in prices, and can cause uh, really negative outcomes. So some of these things, if I pick up on a few keywords here, uh, the marginal cost and scarcity and hard or sound money. Uh, these are kind of fundamental tenets of Austrian economics. Is, is that how you see that as well? Uh, in some ways. So uh, Austrian School of Economics is a uh, branch of economics that uh, uh, has uh, looks at um, economics from the lens of uh, uh, human action. And the uh, choices that individuals make based on the constraints in the market, and so um, I really don't like saying uh, uh, the Chicago School of Economics, the Austrian School of Economics, okay. is really uh, economics, you know, at the end of the day. And uh, so, so it really comes down to things like methodology, uh, and some of the methodology that the Austrians have are um, looking at uh, the, the, the individual and, and uh, knowledge that the individuals have. And uh, so when uh, Austrians look at money, they see it as uh, something that's non-neutral. Uh, so it is something that is a market good, and um, it's something that should be derived through the emergence of 
uh, market phenomena as opposed to through human design. And so uh, when that uh, happens, that's when uh, we can have pretty good signals and uh, a feedback loop to make uh, the right decisions. So I'm with you so far. It sounds perfectly reasonable. You've got a bunch of people, you have scarce resources, time and labor, and we need to make choices uh, in, in order to do that. And uh, the market there is a tool or a protocol to help decide a value to transfer between those scarce resources. Um, so where does all the criticism come in if it is, as you say, just economics? Yeah, it's a great question. And the uh, I'd say the, the criticism or uh, where economics has gone is something that I like to call scientism. And this is uh, really came out in the uh, 1920s through John Maynard Keynes and, and the rise of macroeconomics. And uh, at least the best way I can explain it is um, our attempt to apply natural sciences to social sciences. So if you think about economics, it is a social science. And uh, when we attempt to apply natural sciences to the social sciences, we start presuming and attempting to play God. And this is where there's certainly macro phenomena, but we only really have micro economic solutions and an understanding. So, so going back to Austrian economics, uh, one uh, important aspect is the understanding of knowledge and uh, the importance of knowledge that is really dispersed. So uh, w w when we look at things like Keynesian economics, what there is an attempt to do is collect data and make decisions for millions or hundreds of millions of people based on that data. And that's where you start applying the natural sciences. But at the end of the day, it's impossible to collect enough knowledge and enough data on millions of people in their individual lives and personal interactions and actions and um, to be able to then decide or make decisions that impact those millions of people. So this centralization uh, is really us trying to play God. Uh, that's the human design. And so that um, inevitably leads to unintended consequences. And so uh, rather than let, the, uh, let money emerge through the market, we've created a monopoly on money and have uh, prevented all competition. And by trying to collect data such as CPI and unemployment and um, various aspects of, of what's happening in the economy, uh, a committee or group of people then try and decide what the interest rate should be, for example. Yep. And rather than let the market and supply and demand uh, decide what the interest rates are. And so when, when you try and control this through central planning, through, through top-down um, uh, uh, committees, you start uh, impacting those people on the margin. And so there's very there's been a concerted effort to promote that form of economics because it enables uh, or empowers um, entities that have a monopoly on force, uh, to have a monopoly on money to uh, continue what they're doing. And so um, if you look at where things like funding for economics come from, it's very much uh, heavily funded through entities like, like the, the government. And so they have an incentive to fund economists that say they should spend more money uh, or print more money. For sure. And um, that's uh, very much in their interest. And so uh, when we start looking at things like what causes uh, recessions and booms and busts, the economists don't really have a, a, a good explanation for it. Whereas I, I think the, um, is, uh, the Austrian economists and, and a number of them uh, have uh, fairly um, good explanations, and it really comes around to creating distorted signals in the market. When you uh, create more money than what there should be in the market, 
you are signaling that interest rates are lower than what the market rates are, and businesses are making those decisions and individuals are making those decisions. So uh, this is where we see uh, a lot of borrowing uh, based on extremely low or suppressed interest rates. So businesses and individuals... Heaps, are, right? They can borrow practically for free compared to, yeah. you know, getting a mortgage on a house or something. Exactly. And so by distorting the interest rates, by uh, distorting the signals in the market, the businesses and individuals are making decisions uh, based on those distortions. And so when a business... Uh, borrows money expecting uh, a specific interest rate, which isn't really the market rate, uh, when those interest rates correct, because they have to eventually, the businesses realize that they malinvested. And uh, so investment uh, happened uh, or occurred in capital uh, that shouldn't have been invested in. And this results in individuals and businesses and and people going bankrupt. And so uh, that's kind of what we saw in, in 2008. And uh, many other recessions in, in the past, and uh, could be something that that we are experiencing now. Yeah. Okay. So a, a lot to unpack there. I'll just comment on a, on a few points. So this idea of data, right? So I am on the natural sciences side of things, uh, and just to clarify here, between social sciences and natural sciences, you're talking about involving people in the social side and the natural sciences, you know, we can uh, in some sense remove ourselves from an experiment, collect some data and hopefully different people can achieve the same results. Um, And, you know, uh, physics famously is, you know, the most natural or the original natural science uh, in in that sense. Uh, So to me, the idea of collecting data and applying it to a large group, that sounds, that sounds okay. Uh, uh, And, you know, why, Shouldn't we try to do that even as economists and even as using people as our points of data? Yeah, great question. And a part of it is the uh, we, we don't have the same outcomes every time. And so, for example, if you try and look at a specific good, something like ketchup, uh, and we see that uh, there's a certain amount of uh, ketchup produced every year, and um, that's there's a certain amount of ketchup that's bought every year. Uh, when uh, you, you can't really predict things in the future like a drought or a famine or uh, people's personal preferences, which may change uh, if some other uh, if everyone starts liking mayonnaise more in the future. You can't predict that we'll have the same. Uh, output of uh, ketchup or tomatoes. And so there's so many different variables that when you start applying the natural sciences to economics, you can really come to any conclusion that you want. And so uh, that's <laughs> that's uh, what, what it really boils down that's to. That's great for academics. I can, I can write whatever I want and uh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, if if you want to apply uh, statistics to economics, you can uh, really come out with any conclusion. That's you know, it's it's pretty crazy when you start drilling into it. And so, um, uh, economics is is more a priori. Uh, it's it's a lot more uh, deductive reasoning, and um, what you could do as an economist is look at people's uh, constraints and their incentives and try and understand what they would do next. And, but uh, you would be able to do that looking at a, a generalization. You wouldn't be able to um, predict that for you know, 10 million people, for example. Right. I'm thinking of, to go with the mayo and the uh, ketchup example, of course, the kiwis, they blend them together, right? And they call it tomato. Uh, I've never I've never bought one, but I'm sure it's fine. Um, so when you walk into a supermarket, right, sometimes you don't even know what you're going to buy. But somebody that is buying all the food and stocking the shelves for countdown, they know that somebody is going to go pick up that bottle of tomato off the shelf. And so what I'm thinking here is like, do the data analytics and the data scientists that are working, you know, for the retailer, are they able to draw these aggregate conclusions based on those data points that are coming in? And does that abstract the shopper out of it? And so, you know, so maybe like the 
the countdown data scientist is more of an economist than the economist who is trying to say, oh yeah, Jeff wants that bottle of tomato. But the person at countdown says, uh, out of 20,000 shoppers this week, you know, we're going to sell 35 bottles. Yeah, I mean, the, the market process is uh, definitely a, um, a constantly changing in, in terms of the, um, you know, it's more of a discovery process. And so um, th- th- this is where you have to have a constant change, where a grocery store might not know exactly what people are going to buy. And so uh, they'll put a product there and they'll test it against another product. And they'll see that um, more sales are made with with this product. And so they'll change it. And so they're constantly changing um, to meet their customers' demands and and, um, uh, what what they're interested in. And so uh, that is where we start looking at things like prices. And prices are an amazing feedback mechanism where there's, there's so much information embedded in, in prices of, of goods and services that they help consumers make decisions. So you don't have to know that there was a famine um, or a drought for um, coffee beans uh, to, to know why the price of coffee beans has gone up this year yeah. or why there's a new uh, product, coffee product that's driven demand. And so, uh, the, the prices reflect all of that information and knowledge to enable consumers to make decisions. They don't have to know why, uh, prices are what they are, but they will be making decisions based on their own, uh, personal life, um, settings. Let's, uh, go back to money a little bit. Out of the 2008 meltdown came uh, this, you know, post to the cryptography mailing list. And from that came some code. And from that came a white paper, uh, which we know pretty well. Um, where, do, where do you place in all of this in terms of, you know, studying Austrian economics, looking at preferences, uh, dabbling in gold, and then now you run a digital asset company? So. Yeah, take us back to your earlier earliest discovery of Bitcoin. Yeah, so my my earliest discovery was me laughing at it and <laughs> thinking, uh, how could this intangible thing have any value? And it was a friend from university who uh, set up a contract with me to create gold coins with the Bitcoin logo on it, and that was in two thousand eleven. And so I was happy to create these uh, gold coins for him. And uh, he asked me if I if he could pay in Bitcoin. I said no way, uh, okay. which you know I wish I had done. <laughs> but uh, I thought you know what the heck is this intangible thing? But my studies in um, uh, and particularly one economist, F. A. Hayek, uh, helped me understand not to be a at gold or silver maximalist, that the market is constantly evolving and we can have better forms of money. And the other discovery that the Austrian economists uh, came up, uh, discovered with economics is that all value is subjective. And so it's, it's really in the eye of the beholder. And so um, Bitcoin has a price, it has a value, and that uh, is, is really based on subjectivity and what people perceive and, and believe its value to be. So it wasn't until uh, 2012 that I really started getting interested and in, in heavily involved in, in Bitcoin, where I saw it as not necessarily money. It has to go through a, a commoditization process before it becomes money, but has a highly possible possibility or probability of being money in the future. And, and so early days, there were started popping up altcoins or uh, uh, competing digital currencies to Bitcoin. And a, a large group of people were Bitcoin maximalists and thought, oh, you know, only Bitcoin, nothing else uh, is good. And so my um, earlier lessons uh, taught me that it's really a competitive market. And it's the best ideas and the best product that will win. And so uh, you should definitely have an open mind as to what money is going to be, whether it's going to be Bitcoin or Dogecoin or something else. 
I mean, just on that, uh, I see that there is a contradiction here. Like Bitcoin maximalism on Twitter these days is, uh, is I guess it's a hot topic. People, people love talking about it and so on and so forth. Another point I have here, right, is that the Austrian economics kind of branch or system meshes so well with Bitcoiners. They've really picked this up and, and run with it. Uh, and so is there a contradiction here that the free market can decide on the best outcomes or, or price uh, the most valuable commodity if it's if it's Bitcoin in the earlier days uh, compared with uh, maximalist who says, no, Bitcoin, it's done. It, that's that's the one. Anything else has no chance. Yeah, I, I think I, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why people might say that or believe that. And, and you can see that with somebody like Peter Schiff, who says uh, gold is the only form of money or sound money and uh, Bitcoin and everything else is, is, is crap. And so uh, w when we look at Austrian economics, the idea, uh, and, and particularly Hayek, uh, he had um, really explored this concept of uh, spontaneous order. And he, it came about looking at the natural sciences and seeing uh, things like evolution and that is uh, really a spontaneous order in itself and, and looked at how they impacted humans from a social uh, science perspective. And so we have many different uh, spontaneous orders in, in our um, uh, daily lives, English language, for example, uh, where it's, it's an evolving piece of technology uh, where we don't really know what word is going to be in the English language next year or which ones are going to get thrown out. So it's, it's unpredictable. Um, the, the market is a spontaneous order, prices uh, and uh, the competitive nature of uh, everything, really. Uh, so another example would be looking at something going viral, like a meme or a video. Nobody can really predict that. And so I think Bitcoin maximalists really need to question or look at the value in, in the competitive market where it's likely that there will in the future be one primary form of money, but we don't really know what that is. And it's presumptuous and um, trying to play God if we assume that it's going to be Bitcoin. Uh, we, we can't really say for, for certain because it's this evolving, uh, spontaneous um, uh, mess that's that's <laughs> happening. And it's going to take years and years to flesh out. As a technology, I would say it has gone viral. You know, it's, it's new. And the people that know about it seem to be a bit bonkers. And uh, a lot of people are still very dismissive. But there's, you know, there's enough of a blip there to say that uh, it definitely has gone viral. Hmm. Uh, can we talk about some criticisms of Bitcoin? I want to hear what, what you have to say. Uh, so I was listening recently to an economist on a podcast and uh, I, I was kind of following along and I was with it. Uh, and then he brought up cryptocurrency kind of out of nowhere and spent a few minutes dismissing it because he says there's no value there at the end of the day. You don't have a gold coin to take home with you when you know the markets all go to crap. So what do you say about there's nothing that backs Bitcoin? How can it be valuable? What do you think about that? Yeah, so this is where uh, I think trying to understand from an economics perspective, intrinsic versus subjective value, where uh, I think we've pretty much agreed upon value isn't uh, intrinsic, but, but sometimes people try and, and apply that. And so when you look at something like gold, People will say uh, gold has value because of its intrinsic properties. Uh, that's not really the case. Gold, gold has value because of its utility. So we see uh, the use in gold as a shiny object, as great for jewelry, as um, a way to store a, a large amount of something scarce uh, and for things like industry. And you, you can look at something like oil where... Uh, in the 1800s, people would look at land that was on oil as, as almost like uh, untouchable. You right. know, your land has now become poisoned and uh, you have to sell your land at a loss. 
whereas as soon as people found utility and use for oil, uh, it became black gold. It was highly desirable. Oh, that's such and a good so, example. And so um, the w when we look at Bitcoin, um, we the, its value is, is uh, derived from a few different things. The one is uh, its utility, and the other is speculation or uh, the idea that might have future utility or value. And so the utility, I'd say, does present itself as a way to uh, do things like international settlement. So when you look at uh, Western Union compared to Bitcoin uh, five years ago, um, Bitcoin, you can move $100 and it would cost uh, pennies or less. If you were to move $100 by Western Union, you'd have to pay $35 to the bank. Uh, because of Bitcoin, the cost of, of international settlement has dropped substantially. But when we look at so, um, remittance to places like the Philippines, uh, places in South America or Africa, uh, there's been a huge um, utility and use case in, in cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, uh, not only for remittance, but also for interactions um, in commerce. We uh, most people have cell phones, uh, but that doesn't mean that they have a bank account or a PayPal account. So trying to pay somebody in South America through a bank or through PayPal makes it almost impossible. So if you think about the ultimate resource as the the human imagination, there's there's so much value there that's untapped, and by being able to work with people in uh, other countries that don't have access to bank accounts, we're enabling the unlocking of that human and economic potential. And so uh, that's um, e enormous, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, unfathomably large. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, you're talking about connecting with anyone and being able to, as you say, use, use their time, imagination or labor to collaborate, contribute. contribute. Yeah, and, and something else, like another point I'd like to make around when we look at legacy money, like like the U.S. dollar, uh, and, and I have to refer to it because eighty five percent of world trade is done in the U.S. dollar, and this kind of leads me to believe there's only really going to be one or a few forms of money, and it's extremely divisive, and so um, it's preventing people in certain countries from being able to participate in uh, global economic activity, where most of those people in those places are um, just like you and me, and that's places like North Korea or Iran. And uh, so uh, they cannot access uh, information, ideas, and um, trade with everyone else because they're cut off from the financial system. And when we look at Bitcoin, you find there are people in uh, Ukraine, you find people in China and in Russia, in New Zealand, in Venezuela, U.S. all working together, collaborating to improve uh, Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, so it's creating a lot more collaboration and cooperation as a um, universal language of value compared to something like the U.S. dollar. So it's, it's uh, enabling a lot more uh, global um, cooperation, which is something that we want to have more of. So, I mean, you're painting quite a grand picture here. Could you say that it's not just a money, monetary network then, it's also maybe social or some other kind of network? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very much a uh, yeah, social network by, by many means because of the coordination and, and participation from millions of different people uh, with their own ends doing their own thing, but they have some kind of connection to this. And uh, it's, it's enabling uh, a, a new form of, of governance where you don't need a, the likes of PayPal to uh, interact with each other. We can do so directly, and that's, that's pretty amazing to see. So I, I think it's a great, tremendous uh, use case. Um, is it enough? If we look at some of the technical criticisms, mm. being that it's slow and yeah. expensive, yeah, is it is it going to survive given uh, pot potential scaling issues? Yeah, yeah. So it didn't go into the, the criticisms, and 
uh, you know, 2013, 2014, Bitcoin was mind-bogglingly amazing, where you could send a million dollars and pay three cents or maybe even send a transaction for free. And 10 minutes was a lot faster than the legacy banking system. Uh, in fact, some places like the US, they still use checkbooks. And so you can put a million dollars in cash and fly it from California to New York faster than sending it through the uh, uh, bank system. So, so there's still, uh, we still see a lot of slow uh, use cases when we look at legacy uh, systems. But when you look at uh, currencies or, or cryptocurrencies that are competing with Bitcoin, then we start looking at Bitcoins as being potentially slower. You know, if I'm trying to send it to uh, another service and I'm waiting for three confirmations, I'm sitting around for 30 <laughs> minutes, and um, you know, that's that's a challenge. I, I think that we don't really have the answer. But a lot of people, when they look at blockchain or crypto, they look at it in its current state rather than what it could be. Yep. And I think that's a really bad way of looking at it. It's like looking at uh, the internet in the late 90s and saying, okay, this is the internet and this is all we get. So you can't have things like Netflix uh, because the internet's never going to scale and never going to improve. Uh, we certainly have scalability solutions and opportunities that uh, are being explored and, and being developed. The amazing thing about Bitcoin is its ability to adapt and change and evolve, where they, the source code of Bitcoin today is completely different from when it was launched uh, in, in 2009. And so um, if there's a new innovation, Bitcoin can adopt it. And I think we are moving into a, a new environment where um, that you might have something like a uh, transaction layer and a settlement layer, where Bitcoin is the settlement layer, and for scalability, other solutions, uh, layer two solutions, what they call them, uh, enable the uh, instant transactions or payments that can occur, so enabling much higher throughput of transactions. Now, um, the other area that I think is, is important to, which we do a really bad job in our industry, is defining crypto assets. And uh, people will say, oh, there's 20,000, you know, 20 million or millions of different cryptocurrencies. Yeah, and it's 20,000 on CoinMarketCap recently. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that was the, the comment. 20,000 um, listed on CoinMarketCap and out of uh, a million or a couple million. And I would like to challenge the definition and redefine what we call cryptocurrencies. Because I think by understanding them, putting them in boxes, we have a better understanding of what they are. So when we look at, and I hate using the word currency, because then you start thinking about legacy money and, right. and uh, try and equate it to something like the dollar. Whereas um, Bitcoin is a completely different beast from uh, the dollar or, what we've, or gold or what we've had as money in the past. And so, uh, but when we look at something like um, uh, a definition of, of cryptocurrencies where the token, the digital token, what, what I would say is that we have tw um, tens of thousands or millions of digital tokens. So that, that could be the broad definition as opposed to cryptocurrencies. When we look at cryptocurrencies or digital tokens that can be used as a storage of value and medium of exchange, we see that there's only a handful of them. They have their own networks and um, there aren't many. Uh, that would be Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogecoin, um, uh, privacy tokens like Monero. And there aren't really many of them. So there aren't really many competing with Bitcoin. You notably exclude Ethereum? Yeah, so that would be the next category. And this would be platform tokens or uh, networks that enable applications to uh, get developed on. And so um, when we look at money, uh, it's dumb and it should be dumb as, uh, as a network and uh, as a protocol. We don't want lots of fancy bells and whistles. It's uh, meant to do one thing and do it really well. And so this is where uh, Bitcoin does that. Um, the next category would be platform tokens. They're kind of like the Google, app, um, Google stores or um, Apple app stores of the world where people can develop applications that run 
uh, run on them without uh, any interactions. And so those we see there are dozens more of platform tokens than um, uh, tokens that are used as money. And so I, th I think Bitcoin and Ethereum are apples and oranges. Uh, they're two very different beasts. I think they work well together. And um, so the next category after platform, so, so each one there's a lot more. And I think part of it is the cost of executing it and building that infrastructure. You know, the one thing you said, oh, Bitcoin's not backed by anything. Well, technically that's true. At the same time, there's also this um, multi-billion dollar um, mining infrastructure that's very tangible that is um, securing the network. And so uh, when, when we look at um, platform tokens, there's a, uh, a lot more than there are cryptocurrencies. And then when we look at applications or application tokens, there are thousands of them, tens of thousands. Yeah. So those are the applications uh, built on top and they don't have their own blockchain because of the cost. They are using the security of, of the uh, platform tokens uh, to launch their apps. And then uh, the other would be asset-backed tokens. Those are stable coins um, backed by stocks or homes or gold or dollars. We had a new semester start recently, so we had a group of students in our cryptocurrency class. And uh, so on day one, I point them to CoinMarketCap. Uh, and I'm like, so go explore. And, you know, we're going to write down some words and go start to piece together how all this, how all this stuff goes. And right away... If you're new to it, you're under the impression that these are all cryptocurrencies, meaning that they can be used to transfer value, and also that they're all blockchains. And so even that like first step, that takes a bit to, to get over and, and filter through. And you know, it's not obvious on a website such as that um, where the lines are drawn. Earlier you mentioned about this idea of, you know, humans using the network to not only transfer value, but then you can, you know, unlock potential and you can collaborate. Uh, and so, you know, in terms of a cryptocurrency topic, this sounds a lot like a DAO, perhaps like a, a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, do you see more of that happening going forward? Uh, is that on your radar at all? Yeah, I think for me, one of the biggest light bulb moments was learning about DAOs and how they work. And that, uh, w when I got into Bitcoin, there was no such thing as blockchain. There was uh, little b Bitcoin, which was the unit of account. And there was big B Bitcoin, which was the network. And that ended up being Bitcoin and the blockchain. And so the industry was trying to flesh out our definitions and understandings. And once there was a differentiation and understanding of the two, more ideas started to come through. And it was Vitalik's essay on DAOs, um, I think it was called Decentralized Autonomous Corporations in 2014, that really opened my eyes to the potential of crypto and, and blockchains that expanded far beyond Bitcoin as money. And opportunities and the potential for innovation and, and what we're going to see is, is I, I think, just we're just at the cusp. And so uh, what I see as a, a, a Bitcoin is probably the, the first DAO uh, where it doesn't really have a marketing team. But if you buy Bitcoin, uh, you're probably going to tell somebody about it. Uh, so it's, it's creating this collaboration and cooperation of people um, that is, is uh, a lot looser than, say, a corporation. And I believe that they that DAOs are restructuring the way that we are um, organizing capital, and that is both uh, human capital, uh, human resources, and uh, physical capital like factories and coffee shops and cafes and businesses. And so um, I think that they are... Uh, or have a major implication to uh, corporate structures and corporate hierarchies. And um, although corporations are, are going to be around for decades or hundreds of years, they are challenging the way that um, co corporations uh, um, used to run things. And uh, we see that 
a big aspect of, of why we have a corporation is to uh, capture the labor market. Transaction costs and, and labor uh, uh, enable uh, or re require something like a, a corporation to uh, monopolize somebody's uh, time and skills. And DAOs release that human potential where you might have a certain set of skills that are useful in um, a project or used to be in a corporation for a very specific task. But then once that's done, uh, they need a, a new set of skills where it might be similar to yours, but ranked differently. You know, you might have 15 different skills that are ranked, but now you can work for uh, many different DAOs with your skills and uh, help create a lot more value for them. And uh, so, so when we look at something like a corporation, it's very much a pull system. So the pull system is uh, you have somebody at the top, a manager, they're telling you what they want, um, they're telling you what to do and what you should be doing. Uh, whereas for a DAO, it's very much a push system. You receive value based on how much contribution you make to that network. And uh, so it's very much um, flipping the way that we look at things like work on its head. You know, corporations took a few hundred years to work out their structures, and DAOs have only been around for a few years. So right. it's uh, through this market process of trial and error, um, succeeding and failing, will we start seeing DAOs flesh out and, and really uh, thrive. But that's going to take a long time. So you see it as being much more than just volunteer effort. You actually see that, you know, people can contribute to DAOs and earn for their labor. And in that sense, a successful DAO could actually challenge a corporate that is maybe doing a similar thing in a similar industry. Absolutely. Uh, they're enabling new forms of businesses, new opportunities, uh, new opportunities that are open to uh, entities that might not even be human. So they're enabling uh, algorithms or what you might call AI to manage a business and um, generate revenue and without any human ownership or cooperation. And so uh, it's, it's really enabling all kinds of new ways that we can interact with each other. And um, it comes down to capital um, utilizing capital a lot more effectively. And so uh, a great untapped area, I would say, would be something like insurance. Where there are a few insurance projects or a couple of insurance DAOs, but that's a hundred billion plus industry, you know, trillion dollar industry. And the capital and overhead is very inefficient and ineffective in, in the way that it's managed today. And uh, by enabling, um, and, and also it doesn't really meet the needs of the consumer. And by enabling a um, insurance back DAO as one of thousands of ideas, uh, I, I think we're going to have a lot better solutions in, in the way that we look at something like insurance. Are there any particular examples you've been following that you think maybe have a chance of succeeding or are interesting? Obviously, insurance. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of insurance projects that I that I like. I'm not, um, and, and uh, the idea has been around for a long time. I'm, I'm not going to throw out the specific names, okay. but the um, it's insurance and, and use cases in blockchain have been around for a long time, but uh, have been challenging to implement until uh, the the rise of, of decentralized finance because it's enabling a uh, on-chain solution uh, product that can solve a, a solution in that space that um, and, and so it's enabling the the growth of uh, insurance as a product but the we're just early so early days in, in that regard and I'd, I'd love to see more customizations where you can buy an insurance policy for 37 minutes and uh, it's customized for exactly what your need is, whether you're riding a bike or uh, jumping in an Uber or something like that. Yeah, It's uh, going to create really exciting new 
um, use cases that uh, we, we haven't had. So the consumer is going to benefit. All right. That's not even like a micro transaction. It's like a micro service or a insurance on demand of, of some kind. Okay. We are pretty much out of time. Are you up for some rapid fire? Sure. Okay. First one's nice and easy. What's your favorite place in New Zealand? Favorite place in New Zealand, I would have to say Queenstown, but really just the, the mountains down there uh, remind me a lot of, of Colorado and, and Denver. And it's, it's such a beautiful, beautiful, magical place. <laughs> nice. Good review. Uh, university or YouTube? Nowadays, YouTube. Nothing wrong with that. Are we in a recession? I'm thinking about how the White House has recently redefined the term recession. Hmm. Yeah, hard to say. Uh, I guess it depends on what you would define as, as recession, but it's certainly looking like uh, a lot of uh, bad things happening in the world and people are saving and preserving their wealth as, as opposed to uh, having a lot more economic growth. So, so very likely. Uh, how long until the U.S. loses reserve currency status? Can we set the over-under at, say, 50 years? Would you take under or over? Under. You take under, which could well put it in our lifetime. Yeah, I mean, if, if you asked me uh, some time ago, I you, you would have thought I was crazy saying, oh, it's, it's going to happen in our lifetime. But everything that's happened since 2019, I think, has uh, really made it more and more inevitable with the excessive money printing. Can proof of stake be a basis for sound money? Ooh, tricky one. Uh, you can't say no because it's, it's really going to be up to the market to decide. But my idea or theory is that it's probably going to be some hybrid proof of work, proof of stake. And last one, who is Satoshi? Ooh, I... I'm leaning towards it being a group of people uh, and likely Hal Finney would be one of those, but who knows? We, we really don't know. I, I'd love for it to be Dory and Nakamoto, but <laughs> I don't think that's the case. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much for coming by today. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for joining us, folks. Look out for the next episode of the Blockchain New Zealand podcast, probably in the same spot you found this one. Cheers. Cheers.